This oral history of museum computing is provided by Sam Quigley and was recorded on the 8th of March, 2021 by Paul Marty and Kathy Jones. Um, I can't even remember, Kathy, exactly what year it was where we formalized our friendship in, in, in a contract. You worked for the MFA Boston probably from like 1989 for a while there, or was it even earlier? I can't remember. Gosh. It might have been then. Um, I know, you know, like in the early 1990s, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure it might have been that because I believe we published what we called a needs assessment, a collections management needs assessment in 1991. And that included a very, very extensive data dictionary that you helped create with Bonnie Porter specifically, as I recall. Um, and that was based on an analysis of Primarily the uh, the registrar's cards, you know, which uh, which we had like so many places, you know, a primary uh, full run by numerical accession order in the registrar's office, and Bonnie Porter was the recorder uh, in that department. And then in each of the departments, there were three sets: uh, one by numerical accession order, one by artist order usually and one by genre order and it was that was my introduction to all of this back when I first started working in the musical instruments collection at the MFA uh, where my first job was to try to get my hands around uh, the collection using those three sequences of cards you know mixing and matching to make sure that we represented everything that we had because each one had gaps in them and those cards in the MFA and I'm sure everywhere else uh, became the cornerstone of any digitization of the documentation. Um, God only knows there were plenty other, um, you know, troves of information that were in departments' hands, but we relied uh, primarily on the uh, registrar's cards to make sure that we had a comprehensive listing of the collection of the MFA Boston. But I think I get ahead of myself. Um, in the 80s, I happened to be um, uh, one of the curators who have sort of drunk the Kool-Aid of uh, technology and realized that, you know, computers were uh, very useful to what we do. Um, we do list keeping and ideally we broadcast from those lists um, or some facsimile of them. And I was an early um, uh, advocate and, and, you know, I guess amateur, but it, it, a, a fairly successful amateur programmer. And my initial um, chosen tool was uh, that old faithful DBase 3. Um, but then for reasons of uh, unknown, a friend of mine was into data ease. Uh, so-called fourth generation language, which was really cool. And I developed a little database, which got bigger over the course of time for the musical instruments collection. And ultimately that was seen as something valuable also for the European decorative arts department of which the musical instruments collection was a part. Um, and so I did a, another data ease uh, uh, program for them, and that was particularly useful in their planning of a large move that they were doing. They being, uh, I was part of them, you know, we. Um, and having gotten some initial success, um, and actually even having dabbled a little bit with the idea of using um, a modem, uh, remember those? Um, <laughs> and uh, using a fr another friend of a similar inkling, a guy named Bob Eliasson up in Vermont, another collector of musical instruments, who was a technologist at the time. We tried actually, you know, sh sharing databases online, you know, except for a little tiny network. Well, that soon became kind of, you know, cumbersome, but it opened up some eyes. Um, and I think that uh, it was around that time that I started advocating for the idea of the MFA might really benefit from getting serious about this stuff. Um, the uh, newfangled code HTML 1.0 had not yet been codified at that time. Um, 
it, we, I was also had a friend who was over at the AI lab at MIT, a guy named Jonathan Rees, and he gave me a log on on uh, one of the AI computers, Martin Yee, at MIT.edu, and I thought it was really cool to have that one, I'll tell you. <laughs> but we were using links in order to get around, you know, um, in the pre-visual uh, web. Um, anyway, uh, all of this was great exciting and I started talking about it uh, with people up in the administration about how we really ought to do something important here. Um, at the time the, the MFA was about as much the MFA as it ever was. It was totally uh, silos throughout the building. Um, the uh, classical department had its own way of doing things, and I can't express that in a more <laughs> direct way. Uh, uh, the Asian collection, completely different. The paintings departments, everybody had their own ways. There was another comrade in arms, however, over in the Egyptian department, um, a guy named Peter Dermanwellian, who's now a professor of Egyptology at Harvard. Um, and he was... Um, lightning fast with Macintosh technology. So he was producing um, incredible labels with maps and all sorts of things that had to do with the presentation side of things. He was in the curatorial staff there. Um, and uh, he also was very helpful in advocating for um, a better and more comprehensive um, usage of technology for documentation in the vast collection of the Egyptian department. Um, um, so I remember one time going up to Alan, Ro Alan uh, Shestak, the, the director at the time, and suggesting that we really ought to do something seriously about this. Um, I pointed out that the Metropolitan had already started in the Rati Textile Center, um, a new program uh, to try to organize that. And that program, as everybody knows, became, uh, um, well, now what is it? What, what is the name um, of Jay, Jay Hoffman's? TMS yeah, or Embark? TMS, TMS, no, TMS, the museum system, sorry. It was a while ago after all. Um, and uh, TMS uh, was actually helped, was devised by, you know, none other than Tom Campbell, you know, of the tapestry department at the time and now uh, ex-director of the Met and current director of the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. Um, but he was an early advocate as well. Well, about the same time when I was talking with Alan Shestak, he um, did one of his characteristic puckish things and he pulled out his pen. He said, this is my word processor. Um, and I had seen him do that from the podium in the auditorium in a, in a staff meeting as well. Uh, however, he did recognize that I might have something uh, worth talking about. And he had heard about this idea before. So he suggested that it would be a good idea if I would go out and, you know, develop a proposal. Um, and I believe that was in the late 80s, late maybe 89 or something like that, um, which is when I got authority and a little bit of budget, a very tiny little budget, budget um, uh, to um, uh, create uh, this committee uh, on documentation. And I decided that it would be a good idea to try to get um, several people who were naysayers as well as, you know, advocates uh, of the idea. So in addition to um, Nancy Allen, the current director of the library and very much a strong voice in library information science, um, and uh, Linda Thomas, the current registrar who was very technologically savvy and interested in these things as well, as well as Janice Sarko, who was the uh, chair or the department head for the slide library, which also had um, uh, authority over the photographic lab uh, as well. Um, we had those three very strong advocates for documentation. And then, not to paint them in a bad light, but I recognized that they were very strong voices and ones who were, were going to need to be convinced. But if they could be convinced, 
of the value of this. They would be strong voices in favor uh, of the process. So I asked Cliff Ackley, uh, the venerable curator of the prints and drawings department, which was literally about half of the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts at the time, um, as well as Jonathan Fairbanks, the curator of American Decorative Arts. Jonathan Fairbanks known to everyone as a curmudgeon um, who refused to allow email, I mean voicemail in his office and who preferred to use his royal non-electrified typewriter for all of his correspondence. Um, a true Luddite who is a dear friend of mine and who I knew I could count on to um, grouse about everything and keep us on the straight and narrow. Uh, little did I know that he was going to become a strong advocate as well uh, for all of these things. And I would say the same thing about Cliff Ackley too. And uh, he, Cliff, amongst all of his many, many contributions, both to the concept and to the, you know, cajoling and convincing of his colleagues, our colleagues, he also adorned the cover, the frontispiece of the collection, collections management needs assessment with a drawing of an electrified pencil. Um, quite a piece of, of work that is part of that document still. Uh, so this group, uh, this committee on documentation met for months. I think it was at least a year or so. Kathy was now on, on contract working with Bonnie Porter and with me and with everybody who would listen. Uh, and we proceeded to have many, many meetings, large meetings, some of them, trying to uh, garner support and get people's um, knowledge level up to snuff. Um, and I believe uh, then we presented the, the Committee on Documentation recommendation at a poor time. Um, the museum had just suffered a number of, a couple years in a row of deficits. Alan Shestak, who had commissioned the work, was just handed his hat as he had exceeded the budgetary you know, tolerances of the board. And all of a sudden, nothing was happening. And I think this was around 1992, maybe almost 93. Um, a new broom came in in the guise of Roger, Malcolm Rogers in uh, as I call, I think it was Labor Day of 94. We had a couple meetings of the senior staff curatorial departments um, in which he tipped his hand about how he was shocked and appalled, to quote Casablanca, um, the fact that uh, there were no, there was no centralized doc documentation. And of course, England, everything is very centralized at the National Portrait Gallery, which is where he came from, and the BM as well, of course. So he really couldn't imagine not having a centralized database. Um, I took note of this in October and in November, Nancy Allen, Arthur Beale, the head of conservation, also an advocate for documentation. And um, I started talking about the possibility of developing a proposal for Malcolm Rogers at the time. Um, I believe it was, I, I did a little bit of fields. I had some field work, a field trip arranged in England for some research uh, in January. And so when I got back, I found that these ideas had gotten quite advanced and that Nancy Allen was really um, holding sway with not only Allen, with not only Malcolm Rogers, but his deputy director, uh, Brent Benjamin, um, who previously had been rather skeptical of this idea of uh, unified documentation. But um, by the end of January, uh, it seemed like all all the uh, pieces were in place. And indeed, uh, a couple weeks later, there was an event which um, sometimes some people referred to as the Valentine's Day Massacre at the MFA Boston, because it was on Valentine's Day that Malcolm Rogers laid off 90 people of the staff. And with the money that he was saving, uh, created this new department called the Department of Information Resources, 
in which Nancy Allen was the department head. I was the new manager of collections information and a couple other uh, staff members were appointed to it. And we formalized our work um, in basically on February 15th, 1995. Um, so we sat about, we, we set to work and we challenged ourselves to do two major efforts. One was to uh, transcribe or digitize the information off of the uh, comprehensive index cards for the collection. And for that, we created um, a physical space, uh, which included nine uh, computers hooked up to, you know, to a database that was written by a guy named John Bastow who we all referred to as Limey because he was a Brit and uh, he uh, was quite a good um, programmer. He still, I think, is active and his company at the time was called ArrayWorks. And uh, he was amazing in translating um, my very amateurish needs requirements into this access database, which was then utilized by, um, I think we had about 90 college uh, work study students over the course of around four and a half years um, who just came in for their shifts and pounded in data from the cards. We were immediately adjacent to the uh, registrar's office and so we had a protocol for um, you know getting cards and distributing them getting making sure they got all back and all that. And in that regard, uh, two other people were particularly important. Kurt DiCamillo, who had uh, been working in the slide library and was obviously quite uh, organized and able to you know, manage an office, became our office manager and organized what we call Data Row, the, those nine computers. Um, and Linda Pulliam, who had started off as a volunteer who, but then became so obviously uh, capable of, of doing the proofing, basically. She would review all of the data entry and make changes and nor help normalize it on the fly. Um, and so she was hired as, a, as an assistant for her associate collections manager. I forget what it was called, but she was a very important person in that process. Um, and let's see, where was I headed? Uh, we, we then just, you know, pounded it out, you know, for the next four and a half years. Simultaneously, we decided that we needed to try to capture or capture and aggregate by a whole series of normalizations, all these different little databases that had been grown up in different departments um, using different programs. You know, Shoebox was one, as I recall, that was Egyptian. Um, FileMaker was one that had been made a couple places. Um, you know, there were some Excel spreadsheets. Um, the Photographic Studio was just using Word and Excel at the time um, to track their, their images. So there was a broad variety of things that uh, needed to be captured and aggregated and normalized. Um, and Whereas I was overseeing Data Row via Kurt and, and Linda, I was particularly interested in doing the actual um, aggregation of the databases and working with my colleagues to try to pull in their information. And I also started working up with the prints and drawings department where we basically created some um, basic, basic databases out of FileMaker Pro and then added to them incrementally practically every night. Um, and so it happened that bit by bit, we did, um, you know, acquire, massage, normalize, et cetera, all these various databases. And we're maintaining um, the, this, this one basic database on a single, uh, Macintosh G3 tower under me, underneath my desk. Um, we had 60 users, concurrent users at one point um, off of that one G3. Um, and we were utilizing the ethernet that had been 
installed after the coax, you know, wang net had become obsolete. Um, <laughs> remember that? Um, and let's see. Uh, yeah, it, it was fairly, well, I'm trying to find a nice delicate way to get around the saying that it was a parallel universe, shall we say, because um, the rest of the computing power of the MFA Boston was located in the I, well, I guess by that time it was called IS or maybe IT department. Um, um, but they viewed their mandate, probably because their boss told them to be only uh, to make the cash registers sing in the museum shop um, and to sustain, you know, basic office word processing uh, throughout the building. And in fact, um, try as I may or did to work with them, I found them to be fairly sh just short of antagonistic to this idea of utilizing the computing power of the museum for uh, collections management. Imagine that. Um, and uh, so it really had to be sort of a parallel thing. And it was not all that pleasant, um, the interaction between IT and IR, which is what we called ourselves information resources, um, um, even though we were using their network, um, there was very little else that we had to share. Um, but we worked it out. And over time, they had a new director, uh, a guy named Gordy Sands, who was much more sympathetic and helpful, actually, in, in helping making some of this stuff work. Um, but he had his hands full with other things, and he really did have to pay attention to the business side of uh, the information infrastructure. Um, one of the brightest lights of the whole group uh, that was happening at the time was um, a guy named Jeff Stewart, uh, who was a low man on the totem pole in the photographic services department, which was the new name for the, the slide library. And um, he had, you know, obvious, enormous capabilities, but he was really underutilized and not given much of a chance to do much more than sort of log in the newly photographed uh, images into a very, um, well, rather uh, incapable uh, database. I can't even remember what, what it was kept on. It might've been an Excel spreadsheet. And I urged him um, to think broader and to, you know, be uh, vocal and active and try to develop new ideas uh, and how he could make his job easier. I basically told him, be lazy and be smarter, you know? Uh, so, you know, make better tools for yourself and we'll all benefit. And sure enough, um, I didn't realize at the time, but I, I think it's fair to say he's a genius um, at this and pretty soon, before I knew it, he, he was way beyond Excel. He had gone into SQL Server. Um, he was programming, you know, like crazy. And he had uh, developed uh, a very, very uh, magnificent database for the photographic services. And I know it was really well organized because it was my job at one point to incorporate um, all of those images and all of the metadata about them into this uh, FileMaker database that I've been working on with uh, Jeff and with everybody else. And um, remember, Kathy, do you remember that weekend when we actually set up finally the, the Go and we had scripted, we'd use Apple script to do all of this, uh, you know, incorporation and it took around a whole weekend, I think, to, to you know, access and bring in, I think it was 70,000 image records into the database. It was quite something. Um, Jeff had been great and helpful in that one. I remember seeing the fireworks over the city of Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that was just us popping the corks here. Yeah, it was- All that still running on a G3 under your desk? Yes, yes. Wow. Yeah. And when, every once in a while, that G3 would crash, and I would have to send out a note 
telling people that, you know, uh, the database had crashed, but no data was lost. And there was a particular member of the Asian, Asian collection who will go unnamed, who would always re respond to me and say, as you know, data is plural. So your statement is false. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, if that's the worst thing that I can do here, then so be it. Uh, but in fact, we ran a very heavy, you know, backup system. And yeah, it slowed down to be sure, but we did manage to keep it up and running most of the time. And no data was lost ever. <laughs> um, and so it was that we, you know, moved through, um, you know, February 1995 till around, I think it was around August of 1999 or so, um, when um, lo and behold, we had finished uh, reformatting all of the data from the database, uh, from, from the re records of the re re registrar. I think I forgot one major element, which was, that even though I had personally paid attention to the prints and drawings department initially and developed their FileMaker database, um, it was very important that instead of bringing um, a cadre of, of body pierced and decorated college student, work study students into the hallowed halls of the prints and drawings department, um, we instead decided to deploy the SWAT team of the Museum Volunteer Corps, namely the Ladies Committee Associates, um, who were the alumni of the Ladies Committee, the very proper uh, and very generous Ladies Committee. Um, but after they finished their first three years or whatever, the first term on the Ladies Committee, they ascended to uh, status of ladies committee associates. Um, and they were the most dedicated, the most uh, sophisticated um, group of volunteers I've ever run across. Um, not to mention that they probably all went to Wellesley or Smith and they all were multilingual and proper. Um, they were all incredibly punctual. And they were all really good friends with most of the staff members of the curatorial staff. And so they were welcomed in with open arms by the Princeton Drawings Department. They also were able to read manuscript writing in the ledgers, which was a challenge for many people, myself included. Um, and certainly didn't seem like we were going to be able to ask our college students to do that. The prints and drawings maintained, um, mind you, the Museum of Fine Arts was founded in 1870. Um, and the museum, the, the prints and drawings department, I think, maintained their curatorial acquisition records on ledgers up until around 1911, I think. Um, and so there are many, many volumes of single spaced, you know, handwritten records that the ladies committee associates transcribed from, you know, they, they, they reformatted to database. Um, they were uh, amazing. And I think uh, memory serves, there were something like 90,000 entries in those ledger books alone. Um, because after 1911, you know, they were then, no, actually come to think of, I think that, Seems to me that they might have kept doing those ledgers up until almost World War II, to tell you the truth. I think they, I think they might have gone into the 40s um, or the late 30s. Um, we could check that, I suppose. Um, anyway, there were a lot of them. And the, along with the data row college students, uh, the Ladies Committee Associates did an amazing uh, piece of work. Um, and actually, I will remember and I will never forget uh, the uh, wonderfully inscribed picture of the ladies committee group that they presented me with at the end where each one of them, you know, signed off and were very kind with their affectionate words about how they enjoyed working on the database and helping the MFA bring, come into the 21st century. Um, let's see here. 
there were so many other things that went on. Um, I think, I, I guess one, one of the things, this is where I see I'll do a little self-aggrandizement. I, I, just a little, you know, peculiar thing. I remember with great pride that I was the one who registered MFA.org um, at the, uh, in, in Waze or whatever, who is. Um, and uh, I remember doing it despite a rather strong discussion that we had about whether or not we should uh, be allowed to take the URL MFA.org or whether or not we should modify it by having MFA B or B MFA, you know, because after all, there are other museums of fine arts. Well, my feeling was that first come, first serve. Uh, we were there first, and so we got MFA.org. So that's the story of that one. Um, fun stuff to be thinking about all this going back. Um, I think that we just to bring this whole raconteur uh thing channeling uh jan fontaine and oh look at that kathy has got her own copy of the needs assessment how about that i still have mine too it's just not close at hand that's all um uh you know all of this doesn't exist in the abstract as a matter of fact as live and and fun as it is to remember uh when i was talking with um um, the woman who was at Cleveland who did the oral history for the MFA 50th, uh, whose name right now I forget. She was an Indian American woman. Do you remember who I'm talking about? Yes. Who, but, um, who, what is her name? Sheena. Yeah, Seema Rao. What is it? Seema Rao. Seema Rao, exactly. She's now uh, at the Akron Art Museum and excellent. she does some amazing UX design stuff. She's excellent. actually their chief experience officer at the Akron. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm not surprised. She was really, really smart. I had met her when I was still at the Art Institute, as a matter of fact, when I came to see the uh, Cleveland, you know, wall of moving images, that one. Uh, um, but Seema, was apparently a little bit nonplussed by all this effort that was put into reformatting documentation to get it into digital form. Because by that time, it was just, of course, the way it is or the way it should be, you know, and, and I was really taken aback by that because surely, sure enough, it just to simply have it, to aggregate it, to have it digital seems in retrospect, not all that amazing. Um, it's what you do with it after all. And uh, so um, the end of this long story is that, you know, by around 1999, uh, director Malcolm Rogers uh, had, you know, sort of funded all of this effort, had been patient, waiting for it, for coming along, you know, and he wanted to see some results. He wanted to see some tangible results. So. Uh, he started asking, well, no, okay, you've got this MFA.org thing. Um, we have a website. Um, when are you going to put the data about, database on it? You know, and I said, well, we have to, you know, make sure that all the curators are fine about that. To which he rolled his eyes. Uh, and, you know, by that time, I think it's fair to say there was an, a good bit of skepticism on both sides of that aisle uh, between the director's office and the curatorial staff. Um, and he said, well, yeah, okay, you can try to go convince people to have, to authorize the publication of their data, but you can let them know that I'm pretty impatient about this as well. So uh, it was in my job, job to go around and try to get people to sign off on their things. And we tried a number of um, strategies. And I think the first iteration of digital publication was something like 15,000 records, um, not all of which, by the way, had images even. Uh, most of them were mostly just what we have now called, you know, stub records, practically, you know, just the bare uh, tombstone information. Um, uh, but it was something and something was better than nothing. That was our mantra. Um, and eventually um, uh, 
we were trying to get more and more people to, to put more stuff out there, we started floating more images onto the database to get it a little bit more visually appealing. Um, and by this time, um, well, I guess by this time, a number of museums all around the country were doing similar things and there was much more of a uh, keen interest in seeing what was going on. Little did I know that SF MoMA uh, had been watching what was going on at Boston. And um, one day I saw a job announcement come out that looked remarkably like what job description I had at the time, um, you know, where it was uh, something that they were wanting to do to combine um, resources from the library, the archives, the photo library, um, images, or, you know, act, information metadata from the curatorial departments. And um, so there was this um, uh, job description followed up by a couple phone calls and next thing you know I was um, interviewing out at SF MoMA for a position um, and uh, found myself moving out to San Francisco to become the director of collections there uh, just at the time when the millennium was turning over. A time when you and I Kathy used to joke about how all of a sudden COBOL programmers or Fortran programmers were in demand again because uh, all of the Y2K fears about you know life stopping as we know it, right? Um, fortunately, that didn't come about. And I didn't make tons of money because it didn't wasn't needed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, too bad. We all got into this for the money after all, right? <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, all of a sudden, um, I was out after 20 years, uh, I left Boston, you know, sometime in May or maybe it was June. Cause I think I ended up, I, I figured out that I think I worked in various capacities at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts for 20, for 19 years, 19 years and 10 months, just shy of 20. Um, and, uh, when I got out to San Francisco, it was a whole nother ball game. It was, it was fun, but it turned out to be not exactly what had been um, uh, told to me what was going to happen. Um, and briefly, it turns out that the uh, strategic plan, which was really great, had an evil twin called the financial plan, and they had nothing to do with one another. <laughs> anyway, uh, David Ross was a great director. He was a great interviewer. He uh, got me to come out and was, I was full of all sorts of enthusiasm until I found out that there was no money to do any of the work that he had in mind for me to do. Um, fortunately, um, at that same time, um, Andrea Notman, had uh, fallen in love with a wealthy man at MIT named Keenan Sahin, and he had swept her off her feet, or he, she had swept him off his feet. Who knows how it all works? But in any case, the registrar at the Fog Art Museum, a co-conspirator with Lee Mandel in developing Embark uh, with um, that company out in Oakland, um, whose name I now forget, uh, uh, was um, looking for her next career as a non-working um, uh, person. And all of a sudden, I was able to get a job at the Harvard uh, University Library Museums, the Fog, the Busher, Eisinger, and the Sackler, uh, to become what ultimately was my next big job, the Director of Digital Information and Technology. Um, where I got to work with the one and only Lee Mandel, which was really great. However, I did have to learn about Embark, which I liked very much at the time, but um, ultimately, as I was trying to see uh, that system get larger and larger, we moved uh, from Embark to TMS, which of course had been already acquired, or well, I guess TMS had acquired Embark um, at that point. So it was moving within the family, so to speak. But anyway, I think I'll leave it at that. I think really the story I have that might be worth telling is 
the one about the actual reformatting of documentation at the MFA Boston. Um, there's a lot more to go with it, I'm sure. Funding was a really important part of that whole initiative. Uh, Nancy Allen was able to, you know, run, um, you know, in front and 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 shield a lot of the work that we were doing, you know, to get all the political players in the proper uh, position. And um, I think all in all, uh, the MFA story was a pretty successful one. Um, even though after five years, uh, we only had 15,000 records on online. I think it was about a year later that by d fiat, um, Malcolm Rogers caused the rest of the 400,000 records to go online um, as well uh, in a newly redesigned website, um, which was really quite good. It was terrific to see um, the name that we had dubbed it. Oh, that's right. I forgot to mention that our whole initiative that was coming out of the Department of Information Resources, we called Artemis, uh, which was Art Ampersand MIS, which was uh, Art plus Museum Information System, I guess it was. Um, but it was a nice little logo that uh, was red and gray and, you know, everybody kind of liked it. And it, the first iteration of the newly uh, christened uh, database on the new website was subfolder Artemis, which was kind of cool to see. Um, anyway, let's leave it at that. That's pretty much what I can tell you about that one fairly extensive chapter at the MFA. It's a, it's a great story, Sam. You know, I, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on this transition from homegrown database systems into something like Embark or TMS, because I'm sure you've gone through that transition as well, the, the pros right. and cons that you've seen there. Well, I was a strong advocate to the idea that we needed to work with the knowledge holders uh, in using their uh, knowledge and transferring it into a standardized, a more standardized format. We needed to do that fairly carefully and gently uh, and with them being part of the solution rather than tempting them to hang back and, and not be part of the solution. Um, so um, it was a tool to garner support as much as it was uh, being an open-ended gathering uh, bucket where we could accommodate by virtue of, of constant um, development we could accommodate what in retrospect we might refer to as harebrained you know ideas about what things ought to be you know kept or not or vocabulary that was used to describe things. Um, but by doing that, I believe we felt, we made people feel com more comfortable with seeing their data, their knowledge, their life's work, in, in other words, um, in a completely new format. Um, and it was a good uh, midwife uh, thing f for them. And therefore I believe, it was important for, to accomplish the overall objective, which was to get the data out there in a normalized fashion. I, yeah, I remember um, there was there was all sorts of uh, not not acrimony, but anxiety and and grand concerns about. How, there, how this crucially important information was going to be handled and, and, and cared for. Uh, so it was very important as we made that transition to um, work with them in ways that felt comfortable to them. And when I say them, I'm referring to our colleagues. I mean, you know, the, the MFA Boston curatorial staff was very, very, uh, strong and and excellent, exquisite, really. Um, it's just that they did things in their own rather, you know, specific and sometimes unusual ways. Uh, and it took a series of years to get them to 
see the value of that old, you know, saw that we always say, but not really think about garbage in, garbage out. You know, uh, uh, nobody likes to think of their life's work as garbage in, um, but in fact, the way they had been managing it, it kind of was sometimes. Well, Sam, you also had to help them understand things in almost a different language, right? True. I will never forget the meeting that we had in the classics department and we asked the curator, John, <laughs> what yeah. do you call that? And he said, oh, that's the top line. Exactly, <laughs> the top line, exactly. <laughs> It was the title of the piece, but it was the top line on the card. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And you remember too how we created, you, when we had the capability of, of doing whatever we wanted to was formatting using the FileMaker database. Um, one of the screens that they could use was actually a replica of the card, including the hole in the bottom center. <laughs> <laughs> and for some people that using courier typeface too, by the way, you know, that was a very comforting thing. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's a good example of helping people get over some of this uh, fear. Um, right. I, I kind of it relates back to what you were saying earlier, right? That, um, I, right, I mean, you all started in 1980 doing this. I started in 95, you know, 15 years later. For people who started 2010 or 2015, right. Right. it's hard, I think, for them to imagine the fear. I, I can remember talking to registrars who said, I, I don't want to do this. I, we can't put our information online. Right. You don't see that much <laughs> oh. these days. No. Um, although, I, Sam, you, sorry, go ahead. I used to say that we had to stay within shouting distance of the popular culture, uh, because at that point in time, you know, uh, this new thing, the World Wide Web, you know, that was so obviously going to just take over. And, you know, yet it wasn't until the summer of, I think, 96 or so when, you know, it really took on, you know, efficacy with regard to you know, commercial real estate or, you know, com commerce, basically, you know, uh, and along with that, if we hadn't jumped on beforehand, museums have been left out of the picture entirely, I think. As a key point, I, I love the quote you just said, had to stay within shouting distance of the popular culture. Right. You know, Sam, it reminds me of something, I want to say, was it an MCN in 2010 that was in Chicago somewhere around then, 09, 11? <laughs> Yeah, it was because we were too expensive at the Art Institute to be a host, I think. <laughs> yeah. well, whatever it was, I remember there was a great session which had museum directors and museum CIOs telling stories together. And I yeah. seem to remember, now correct me if my memory is wrong, that you and Jim Cuno got up there and talked yep. about some of your experiences. That's and right. I have this amazing memory of the two of you talking about when the Art Institute went on YouTube for the first time. Right, right. Well, and that was the other thing too, you know, Jim was the, the director of the FOG, the, the, the art, in, art museums of, of Harvard at the time that I got hired, he hired me there. And um, mind you, this was 2001. I started working there in April of 2001. And at Harvard University Art Museums, there was no database online. Um, and yet they were admitting students who were born after the World Wide Web had been born. You know, um, actually that's not quite true, but they would shortly be doing so anyway. But, um, you know, Jim said, we got this, you know, all this stuff, but we just haven't organized it. And sure enough, it was an easy thing to, you know, sort of organize, take, take the Embark database, which was still growing rapidly. And, uh, you know, our first iteration was like 65,000 records went right online because they had done so much work for such a long time, imaging everything. Um, and, and then it was another, you know, it was a couple more, five years or something like that, that we had successfully done the data capture and were ready to publish another 220,000 records or something like that. So um, when Jim got 
hired to become the director of the Art Institute of Chicago, you know, he came into a situation, and I believe this was around 2004 or something like that, where they only had 800 works of art online in terms of a database. Um, and that was only the result of the rights and reproductions group that were trying to sell those images um, and, and data about them. And so it was like one of those phone calls that you dream about, it, you know, with Jim saying, you know, why don't you come on out and we'll do it all over again. And um, sure enough, again, moving out there, there was a lot of data worked up already in a normalized fashion, but there had not been the impetus um, coming from, um, well, Dick, Jim Wood beforehand uh, to actually publish it. So again, it was a relatively easy effort to push, you know, I forget how many thousands, maybe 30 or 40,000 uh, works uh, or records out online almost immediately. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it was kind of amazing that at those advanced times, there still weren't many records online. Um, so in retrospect, it's hard to imagine how anybody ever, it could have ever been that way, but it sure was. Anyway, <laughs> we've come a long way, like I said before. before. Yeah. And, you know, when I was meeting, talking with Seema Rao, I mean, with her, you know, capabilities of UX design and, you know, all the great things that are being done, you know, it's understandable that it's not clear and present how all that data ever got there. It's just the vocabulary that is necessary to do all the cool things that are being done now. And it took a lot of time. Now, once it's in some sort of digital form, you can transform it and migrate it and, you know, add attributes and all those other things that you can do wonderful things, but you had to have the basic data set, you know, available to you. And again, it connects nicely to this theme of invisible work, because if you hadn't been doing all that work in the background, unseen, that few people even understood why you were doing it or what you were doing, the museum wouldn't have been ready to move right. into the next phase. Right? Well, and, and indeed, not, not only a few people didn't understand. I remember there was another colleague who I only really became uh, friendly with um, at the Aga Khan project when I went to work at Harvard. Uh, and I remember one day, you know, he actually said, so you went to the dark side, you know, <laughs> referring to having given up my curatorial, you know, stripes and gone to the information technology. It, it, it was a wonderful, wacky world back then uh, and full of a lot of characters. It still is, I'm sure, but um, the, the, the lines were drawn a little bit more clearly before. Um, because after all, as another thing I said a lot of times too, and Kathy, you, you'll bear me on this thing. You might even see this, you know, the problem is not databases. We've got lots of databases rocking around. In fact, they are on two legs. And when they retire, they walk right out the door, you know. Uh, so we had huge troves of knowledge about our collection that were suddenly inaccessible to us. Well, I mean, Cornelius, for one, right? For example, yeah. Just you lose all of that information because they weren't equipped, I'll say, right. to put it into a database. Right. Fortunately, Cornelius authored a book almost every year, you know, so he, he you know, disgorged in a way that certainly matters. Uh, but... Um, I remember another one, Peter Sutton, he used to, he was the curator of paintings at one point in the MFA. And I saw him years afterwards uh, on an airplane and he said, yeah, I remember when, when I knew you before I was an author, now I'm a content producer. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I like he, he used to, he used to produce a, a book a year too. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Lots of characters. Yeah. Well, and then there was there were other yeah there it was it, there was real ambivalence, maybe warranted now in retrospect you know towards the idea of making all this data pr 
previously private information, private bailiwicks, you know, of these little silos out there, you know, and, and I'm sort of mixing and matching. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, we're very, we're very skeptical and wary of, of privacy issues nowadays. In fact, I mean, I, you probably do it too. I quote, I joke about how privacy is such a 20th century thing, you know, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> but it's, you know, it was a real issue back then. It, people were really worried and obviously with very good reason. Um, but in the bottom line, you know, privacy of your own, you know, personal life is quite a bit different than privacy for collections held in public trust, uh, you know, by museums who receive, you know, you know, tax-free status and all the other things that come along with it. Um, I always felt that we were obliged to share our data. And in fact, we love sharing our data. So this is just a new way of doing it. And how many times had we been, you know, queried about, well, you know, if we give too much information away online, will people still be inclined to come to the museum? You know, it's well, yeah, <laughs> ever since they started publishing black and white, you know, post postcards, you know, it just gender engenders more and more interest and, you know, colored slides. Wow. That, you know, another level. And then all of a sudden, you know, you know, I mean, remember sister Wendy and other kinds of, you know, things that the curators would scoff at, but in fact, it brought more people's attention and awareness and, and, you know, hopefully their support to the museum. So, and, so it all worked out. It's just, it's difficult to see how the future is going to, you know, unfold while we're in the process of doing that. 